You're listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim, a podcast dedicated to the private lending industry. I'm Kevin Kim, and my goal is to sit down with key figures in the private lending industry to talk about their business and their personal lives. We'll get their takes on market conditions, the industry at large, and their personal stories. Overall, I really want to learn more about how they started and grew their businesses. So whether you're a lender, a borrower, a vendor, an investor, or anyone just interested in learning more about private lending, this podcast is definitely for you. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy this week's episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. Nadell is a proud sponsor of Lender Lounge. Nadell helps connect companies to end users through branded items, custom items, and creative solutions. They have collaborated with established, globally known enterprises and the most exciting up and coming companies to create unparalleled branded experiences. With attention to the smallest details, Nadell helps you pursue your biggest goals. Their founder, Jack Nadell, first began creating branded merchandise in Culver City, California in 1953. With Nadell, products and experiences are transformed into memorable brand moments. For some, that means providing something immediately useful, like the perfect notepad or eco-friendly water bottle. For others, it's more intangible. They're creating something of sentimental value to take your breath away. Whatever you're looking for, Nadell can make it happen. Perfect for trade show giveaways, new hire gifts, awards, and more. For inquiries, please reach out to Ben Goldberg at ben.goldberg at nadel.com. Hey guys, this is Kevin Kim here for Lender Lounge with yours truly, Kevin Kim. We're here with a very special episode with our friends Alex and Beth. And for all our listeners, you may have seen them on the podcast circuit in real estate lately because... They have recent, recently released a very cool book. And so I'm not going to drone on about who you guys are and what you guys have been doing and how cool you are. I'll let you guys do that. So why don't you guys introduce yourself, the company, the book, and we'll go from there. So the book is called Lend to Live, Earn Hassle-Free Passive Income in Real Estate with Private Money Lending. And it all started with the a dinosaur. So I'll punt it over to Alex to tell you about how she came up with this great idea to create a community to support small and truly independent private money lenders out there. Cause there just really wasn't a place for that. Mm-hmm. And I'll let her take it from here. Yeah. So, uh, I, during COVID the world shut down, couldn't mm-hmm. go out, couldn't socialize with people. I am married to an extreme introvert. So if I get 10 words out of him at once, that's like a really chatty Kathy day for him. Mm -hmm. So I went looking for other people to talk to that invested in real estate in this way. And I just could not find other people for discussion to ask questions, the whole nine yards. Right. And someone, just a friend of mine in the area dared me to start a Facebook group. And I'm like, I'm a chemistry professor. I don't don't do this. Mm -hmm. And he's like, just do it. Oh, I did it. And then it just, it literally just took off. I mean, the group's just a little over two years old now, and it just became a life of its own. And it became a place for people to come together. We've had borrowers meet lenders. We've had lenders meet business partners. We've had other people meet business partners in real estate. It's just, it's been just this amazing journey that I didn't think this was where it was going to go. I just wanted people to talk to during COVID (laughs) about (laughs) private lending. (laughs) That's where I started the podcast. I was like, well, I'm, I'm kind of bored. <laughs> <laughs> well, we weren't because bored, but we wanted, I mean, so, the, so our audience can know what it is. What's the name of the Facebook group? Uh, the group is called Lend to Live Private Lending Lessons. Okay. So if you're listeners, if you're not on there already, get on there. I'm on there. It's great. So keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Beth and I actually met through the group. um, And I think like the first time we had actually like met in person, we were probably about halfway done, if not majority done with the book when I just flew to Seattle. And I'm like, hey, I'm your internet friend from Zoom. Really? I didn't know that. That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've only met, been in person, what, two, three times, three times, three or four times now. Right, because you're on the East Coast, right, Alex? Yes, I'm in Virginia. you're up in, uh, up in Washington, right? Yep, in Seattle. In Seattle. So, so yeah, cross country right? collaboration thanks to right? Facebook groups. That's very cool. And uh, so it was just, it, it worked out kind of funny. It was always something like we were always getting asked by people, you mm-hmm. know, what's a good book I can read about yeah. private lending? And my brain is like, there's just not really any good ones. <laughs> like, no. there's nothing that's application, you know, no. how to do this. And, yeah. uh, 
just one day I got stuck in a rainstorm on 301 in Maryland. I was going to visit more Zoom friends and uh, I was stuck in traffic and like it just hit me. I'm like, this book is done. Like it's like it was already done in my brain. It just felt done. Right. And then I look over and I'm st- like right next to this like 25 foot dinosaur that exists on 301 in Maryland. And I'm, I love dinosaurs. And I'm like, oh, that's a sign. There's going to be a book. And I think I called her like on the way home from that trip. And I'm like, hey, do you want to do a book? And she's like, yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Well, you know, we'll get around to doing that when things calm down. And then like two weeks later, I'm like, Beth, here's some stuff. Like, here's like 35,000 words. And she's like, what is this? I'm like, it's the book. And she's like, what? We're doing that? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, never dare her, right? Because anytime anyone ever dares her to do something, she actually makes it come to fruition. I love that. So, I love that. There's yeah, so many stories amazing. in our industry like that. Hey, I bet you won't. And then all of a sudden, here we are. So, right. But th- so, so I want to understand your guys' background. You mentioned you're a chemistry professor by trade, Alex, but, but Beth, I mean, um, a lot of our industry people up in up in the Northwest know, you know, the 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 business. But I want you to introduce it. And so, you guys are both in private. You guys are both private lenders, right? You guys are both in the industry. So, give us a little bit of background about the business side and your involvement in the industry. I want to translate that into the book. Sure. So, my company is pri- uh, Flint Family Lending, mm-hmm. and we operate. I call ourselves a money matchmaker, um, but really, we kind of broker capital from ourselves and other uh, capital partners. Mm-hmm truly private individuals wanting right. us to help with their origination and deal flow mm-hmm. um, and place them directly with borrowers in our region. And so mm-hmm. that allows us the flexibility to do some creative financing that maybe other institutionally backed lenders can't. So mm-hmm. seconds and cross collateralizations, things that get a little goofy, but still make sense, you know, both mm-hmm. to the borrower and the lender. Mm-hmm. And when I was growing our business with my husband, Matt Flynn, I was really in a hard place because I didn't have anybody else to talk to. I was a little bit nervous about reaching out to my cohorts in my market because it is a competitive business, right? And so I think I probably looked on Facebook and LinkedIn and searched for groups to participate in, which is where I found Jirasi and where I found um, Apple, Mm -hmm. but they were geared a little bit more towards your more institutional capital. Mm -hmm. Um, and fund managers. And so mm-hmm. I think I, I finally found it mid COVID after Alex had started um, private lending lessons for a couple of months, at least. And I just thought, wow, finally, what I'd always wanted to create, but just never really wanted to manage. Right. She put it out in the universe and it just happened to be that we get on a phone call and she's a chem professor and my corporate background and my former life was 20 years in corporate training and development. So Mm -hmm. as an instructional designer and a professor, we just had educating other people really at the core of who we are. Right. So it made sense to bring private money out into the open so that people like me who are trying to just build a business and understand it and do it legally and um, safely had a place to connect with others and share best practices. And Alex made all that happen. Damn, that's a lot. <laughs> that's really right? cool. I, yeah. That's so cool. I mean, it's just really no, because, just out of thin air. No, something it's, it's, like it's this just like happens, literally but I needed there. it so bad. <laughs> just like poof, it appeared. And I remember yeah. during COVID, like Leslie, Leslie's like, have you seen this Facebook group? I'm like, I, I, I've been in these LinkedIn groups forever, right? In, in, in private lending. And they've always just been just marketing materials. I'm like, okay, I get in there and it's like, and it's people that I've been talking to privately because I do a lot of the consults with new lenders, right? And so I'm very passionate about new lenders and then helping them get in the space. But like, I'm a, I'm an attorney. I can't do anything beyond the law. And so it's like, whoa, this is this is the best thing for the industry since since the foundation of AAPL because th- we didn't have anything back back then. And now the problem, like you said, the problem is the disconnect because the industry's grown so much. And so there's this massive disconnect. And what always struck me as a big need was not just education, but like I said, community. So, I mean, Alex, tell us more about your private lending background, your industry background, and then we'll, we'll start talking about the book. So I am a military spouse. Uh, we move a lot. Uh-huh. And part of that is, you know, 
you have to kind of restart your life every time you move, like right. your grocery store, your doctor's office, your vet, like everything just gets reset every time you move. Mm-hmm. And so for me, employment has always been a problem. And it's still a very big problem for a lot of military spouses sure. because we're either unemployed or underemployed. And right. we are literally referred to as dependents, which drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had to find a way that I could still bring in income to my household, still contribute financially to my household, but a career was obviously not, not on my plate. It just Mm -hmm. wasn't going to be possible moving as much as I was. So, uh, at this RIA meeting, I happened to just bump into somebody who turned out to be a private lender and a hard money loan broker. And this was like 20 years ago. So back mm-hmm. before like phones were smart and we were still faxing things. Yep. And I really got to see the real estate investing business from the mm-hmm. other side uh, because, you know, you're driving out to 1003s to borrowers actually at the property. You know, you're walking, you know, looking at the scope of work mm-hmm. and it just kind of clicked like this is I could do this. And then with as much moving as we were doing, uh, uh, being military affiliated, you kind of run into other military affiliated people and we would, you know, work on a deal with them. We would be, you know, offer some debt for it, you know, whatever it happened to be. It was never really super formalized. It was just like, hey, we have cash to invest. You're an active investor in this in this area, in this market. Mm-hmm. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. And then when COVID happened, I mean, it shut down the world here and just in general in Virginia. Right. And uh, a friend of mine from this real estate, you know, military Venn diagram, he was actually going to lose out on a deal because his hard money lender shut their doors like three days before he was supposed to close. And he just happened to be sharing the story. I was like, well, I was like, yeah, we could do that. And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, why not? Let's do it. Right. And that kind of kicked it off in a much more formalized manner where it's like, OK, like we could actually do this. Like I could make this a business in a backpack and then everywhere my spouse gets stationed, as long as I know my market and the rules for that state and the usury right. laws and licensing, like I could do this from anywhere in the country. I mean, mm-hmm. anywhere in the world, really, as long as I got electricity and Internet access. And that's what was really kind of the impetus for me to really say gung ho, like, this is what I can do. This is what I can do while my spouse serves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to constantly rebuild it every time we move. So you started your own private lending business effectively and you were self-funding. Yes. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And this, and how long did you did you do it for? Because you you started twenty years ago. You said no, no, no. I started well. I started working for the hard money loan broker about twenty years ago. We had uh-huh. done loans off and on, you know, right. different duty stations. Um, but actually, making it a formalized business actually happened in twenty twenty, where we got serious about There's a lot it of gaps lo- in the market. In yeah, 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 exactly. So, so you're both. So you're both. Effectively, you have your own lending businesses and your own local markets. But what's fascinating to me is you guys took it upon yourselves to not only create this community, but also, and by the way, for those of you listening, like this community is great. Like if you're, even if you're one of the bigger lenders out there, I was, <laughs> we had a, we had this interesting conversation with a big institutional client and he was looking for more counterparties to work with. I'm like, dude, this is where you got to go. If you want to find more con- counterparties to work with, and you want more originators, that's the place to be because those folks have the loans that you want. So it's not just for the small guys. It's actually, a, it, it could be it could be useful for everybody. But the idea of a book, because I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have any, you know, have any time to, to even read a book these days. The <laughs> fact that you guys wrote a book, but the material in the book, you know, I, 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 I can't say I read all of it, but I read as much as I could in preparation for this interview. What was really interesting about this book is you kind of attacked it from two different ways. And I, I was interested to look at that because you had the perspective of the kind of the investor, right? Someone who's really just kind of looking to make a nice return, right? But you also looked at it from a, if I'm, if I want to be a new lender, if I want to start figuring out how to do these kind of deals myself, you laid it out for them. And what was interesting was, you guys had a fresh take in this book about a very hot topic in the industry right now, um, even at the institutional level. There's the lingo that we use, right? The phraseology, or the, I think, Beth, you said you call it the taxonomy. I, I, that's the, by the best, the app, most app word for this. The terminology in this space is never consistent. And I want to hear your guys' take on this before we get deeper in the book. Private lending, private money, hard money, 
And you guys differentiate this because in my brain, it's all kind of all the same. So I'd like to hear your distinction on this. To be fair, we didn't really set the definition. Mm -hmm. The audience, the broader audience of active investors, where a lot of them now congregate and learn from bigger pockets, which I know you know that real estate education platform. We're really tapping into their defined version of what a private money lender is versus Mm -hmm. true hard money or institutional capital. Mm -hmm. So I don't Mm -hmm. really believe that it's something that Alex and I are necessarily creating net new in terms of a a separate definition. We're not challenging convention because I don't know if convention is the same within our own lending industry as it is in the broader real estate investor community at large. Mm -hmm. So that actually is is an interesting point because in this debate, in different communities of the industry, right? Different organizations and different trade associations and different campaigns I've seen. There's been the debate between private lending and and, and hard money lending, right? And when, and I always, and this whole debate came up and my, my take on it was exactly that. Like, I don't care what you call it. It matters. It doesn't matter what you think you are. It matters what your borrowers think you are, right? If your borrowers think you're a hard money lender, you're a hard money lender. Right? And, that's, and that, that was the interesting part about this. But was the, the, the noticeable distinction that I did re, I did read in the book was the differentiation between hard money, aka private lending, which is called one big group, and then and then private money lending, or private money, because this was a, a vast differentiation. And I'm not too familiar with how Bigger Pockets audience differentiates that. So for our audience, why don't you guys share what the differentiation is? So in our eyes, when we are talking about a private money lender, Mm -hmm. we are generally talking about individuals that are lending out capital. Maybe it's their own capital, capital they directly control. Um, Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the hard money lenders, and this is where you're talking about it affects the borrower. Mm -hmm. The hard money lenders, while yes, they have access to millions and millions of dollars of capital, that capital comes with strings attached. Mm -hmm. They got a warehouse line of credit that they sold a bank on their business model. Model, you know, mm-hmm. we will not lend to anybody under a 620 credit score. You know, we will only lend on properties at this, this, and this metric. And if right. you go to a hard money lender as a borrower and you don't check all the boxes, they can't do the loan because they're either going to turn around and sell it on the secondary market. So it has to be conforming to some degree for the secondary mm-hmm. market to want it. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to have to do something for, you know, business warehouse line of credit. They've got their own parameters. If it's a debt fund, they have their own parameters. So it's just, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of strings attached. And whereas what Beth and I are talking about for private lenders, since it's our capital or capital we directly control, we have that ability to flex and say, okay, you know, we don't care what your credit score is, or we Mm -hmm. don't need monthly payments or, you know, all these different variables that Mm -hmm. aren't really super uh, available, honestly, mm-hmm. in in the hard money space, because mm-hmm. they have all those strings attached to the capital they're using. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So that more flexible arrangement is is what is being referred to as private money lending, because it's private money, it's money that you control. It's kind of interesting because the, the the differentiation that I've been making in my career has been kind of along the lines of like the the concept of private lending has kind of become a synonym for what we used to be called soft money lending, right? Like bank lending right. and what you're describing, right? A lot of the institutional types, they've got a very, very, they've got a securitization driven credit box, right? And they have to, I guess, keep their overlords happy when it comes to the Wall Street guys, right? But there's always been this kind of small, it's been shrinking. The industry has kind of started this way. When I started in this space, everyone did it this way. Everyone, it was all, you know, no one ran appraisals, no one ran credit, pure asset based, the deal was structured to their comfort, right? Yeah, they may have had a warehouse line, but you know it was never meant to be like this massive uh, strategy to, to drive the business. That strategy has really fallen by the wayside. I, I can I can name a handful of clients now that truly go in that direction, and and they still exist at a larger scale. But what's interesting is how the borrowers view this. Right, because I've I've always told our people, our industry people, and I think I really want to start this home during this interview today. It doesn't matter what you call it, it what you call it, it matters what your borrowers call it, because your borrowers are going to be looking for either a private money lender or a hard money lender, and if you don't know what the difference is, you can't make that deal happen. Plain and simple. So, I mean, from that perspective, the book, but 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 the book is giving tips and tricks to a lot of those people who are like, I want to be a new lender. 
So let's talk about that. So for the new, for, for this is an educational book, but it's also kind of a a strategy guide in a lot of ways, right? Well, so. It's educational for somebody who's a passive investor. Mm-hmm, I think that's mm-hmm. really the key distinction here. You can call us whatever you want, right? right. And even I, my business as a private money matchmaker, I'd argue whether or not this is, I, I'm even considered, you know, I'm more of a broker, mm-hmm. um, but I'm still dealing with truly private capital to Alex's right. point. We do have direct control over our Those funds. folks call the shots. They, but I mean, they if you're have... putting private lender on your IRS tax return, then you're probably yeah. not a private money lender, right? Because right. you're maybe semi-retired or retired and you're lending out capital to the kid down the block that you saw grow up and is now a full-time flipper. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not necessarily your trade. It's not your occupation. So right. we do make a distinction. Like those truly small individuals who might do this as a side hustle or passively um, on the side to create cash flow, mm-hmm. that's who we're targeting. Not right. somebody who's going to be making an active business out of this like myself. Right, right, right. And that's a, that's a, actually what this industry is founded on. And a lot of people forget about, I always like I have to remind people that this industry was founded on that type of funding source. And and a, a vast majority of the industry is still found, funded by this fun, kind of funding source, and a lot of people don't. Oh yeah, but it's so it's so institutionalized. But granted, that institutionalization is a product of the secondary market. It, it's a it's a minority of originators that are backed by these folks, and the vast majority, just by pure numbers, are supported through these high net worth investors who love this as an investment strategy. Right. So let's talk about the profile of this strategy from an investor's perspective. Talk about that real quick, because I, I I can talk about it all day long, but we're, the, our, our audience is not here to listen to me. They're here to listen to you, right? So <laughs> why don't you guys talk about that real quick? Because I think that is important. The virtues of this industry as a whole, this asset class as a whole, from an investor's eyes. Well, I would say, going back to the book a little bit to answer that question, um, it's not so much the people that just do onesie twosies a year. Mm-hmm. From my perspective, it's you have to start somewhere, right? Like mm-hmm. these are actually like potentially the next generation of lenders coming down the pike to right. scale in the next five to you know ten years, whatever their goal is. So they have to get kind of a good foundation, right. and if they do, you know, half a dozen loans with their own capital, they they've kind of literally taken on a hundred percent of the risk because it's their own capital. So. Mm-hmm. They tend to want to learn things really well. They want to know how to safeguard their money so they can be good fiduciaries if they do decide to scale up. Mm-hmm. So I would say from from that perspective, it's those people. It's really very flexible. It could be the people that maybe uh, we talk about a couple different profiles in the book. Like maybe mm-hmm. it's a retiring landlord. You know, somebody who maybe you have twenty single family homes and you're getting up there in age. And you just really do not want to have your heirs worry about 20 single family homes. So right. they'll they'll start potentially liquidating or pulling out equity from these to do private lending. Mm-hmm. So if something were to happen, the heirs are getting essentially cash or cash flow as opposed right. to 20 houses with 20 mortgages and 20 roofs to deal with. Right. Um, you know, there's active investors that also private lend. I think that point isn't brought up enough. It's a lot of people tend to view it as like something you graduate too. Like, I'm going to be a fix and flipper until I can be a private lender. And it's like, well, you can do both at the same oh, yeah. time. So it's it's also something that can be done while you're an active investor. I mean, there's just it, people lend out their retirement capital while mm-hmm. active investors and other investors deal. So it's it's really something for anybody, in, in our opinion. You know, like you mentioned, the book is actually written kind of in this very bipartisan way. So if someone is an active investor, they can start cultivating their own capital and saying, hey, right. read this book. This is all the ways I'm going to safeguard your capital. Here you go. So it's it's actually meant to be a resource for active investors and passive investors. Right. But what I noticed was interesting was it 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 didn't just it didn't it just extol the virtue because extolling the virtues of this of this asset class as an investment has been done before from a book standpoint. I mean Anthony wrote one, right? Just purely from an investor perspective. But the fact of the matter is like showing them how to become a lender was the hard part. And kind of let's talk about that real quick. So what are some key things that you guys discussed in this book to explain to them about jumping into this space now as, as you know, you're doing these deals now? What, what, do you, what are some of the things that they should look out for that you guys wish you guys had known before you wrote the book? 
Well, I think the first thing that we wanted to know is how to do it legally and right. safely, right? right? I mean, that's just at the very core is we just don't want to screw up because this is our hard-earned money. A lot of us right. aren't, you know, we might be high income earners or we've saved every penny um, or maybe we've rolled over uh, a 401k that was legacy from a previous employer. But we know the returns. Everyone talks about the returns, but nobody right. says, how do you actually get this across the finish line? Right. Um, right. And so we wanted to write a book that actually helped write it out in a very process oriented format. Right. But knowing that it's not really like this checkoff list of things to do because it's such a highly nuanced industry. I mean, Mm -hmm. everything from vendors, systems, you know, a lot of the systems, like they can't even be hard coded because the way you do private lending is just, you know, 100 different lenders will do it 100 different ways. So how can an app app origination uh, software application actually suit everybody's needs? And so we wanted to present the contemplations that a lender needs to take. Mm-hmm. On both sides, right? Do you um, how do you underwrite the borrower? How do you underwrite the property? How do you take into consideration this overwhelming amount and wealth of information in front of you that you might not actually be able to do some critical thinking on some of those right. parts, right? Right. Because we are lay people trying to make it happen, and there really wasn't a book out there to do that. And so we want right. to talk to people about how to build a virtual team using great attorneys, you know, like your, your firm. And we do appreciate the shout out. I tell you that much. <laughs> I was, I really do appreciate it. We were reading. I was like, Oh, Hey, Hey, Hey. Yeah. This has really been a tremendous resource for me and building out my practice, being able to have access to you and your team has been overwhelming to be able to come and listen to your presentations, um, at captivate and innovate and at the Apple conference have helped me. And you guys put out a ton of educational information that really truly is targeted at just the baseline foundation you need just to get started. Right. Right. And so there's much so of what we see out there though. is geared there's towards so that though. Yeah. Like when but you're there's operating, so- there's so many little things that we're, we mm-hmm. can't touch, you know? So it, Talk about, like so. What, what, what were some like I guess misconceptions that a lot of your audience, like people that you gotten feedback on? Like, I, I hear a lot of this, and so what are some of the misconceptions that you guys kind of you kind of busted for a lot of your audience when they got the book, the hand of the book? Oh, I'm gonna say number one is that risking or lending is risky. I get mm. that a lot, um, mm. and it's like, okay, well, yeah, it can be. I mean, driving can be risky. Right. So, you know, it's just a matter of what are, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So I think one of the things I like about how the book was written is we weren't necessarily saying don't do this and do do this. Right. We were giving reasons like, hey, if you don't do this, here's a consideration on what could happen downstream. Right. So they can make their own decisions because everybody's risk tolerance is going to be different. Everybody's right. goal is going to be different. Right. So we really wanted to make it where we were able to convey the flexibility. So like mm-hmm. Beth mentioned, it's not a checklist. It's not like, you know, hey, what documents do I need? to get from the borrower like just give me the list and i'm like okay well that's great but what are you going to do with all that information yeah. it like- forced it, it did it did raise <laughs> more thought than anything else like you laid yes. out options which was nice because put lessons but- learned at the end of each chapter so they understood right. What were the pros and the pitfalls of doing lending a certain way or if you right. ignored a certain aspect of it, right? Because that's what I think people don't really understand mm-hmm. is what is the risk and how do we mitigate as much of that risk as possible? Right, right. And what I did like was also you kind of had a general national uh, kind of approach to it. We've seen a lot of people put out content for their kind of regional market and it doesn't cover like for example the simplest concept of judicial versus non-judicial and so it was really refreshing to see that and well what, what i liked about it the most was the, and you guys mentioned this early on like right now the where the industry is at right now we we as also a content provider to the space an educator to the space we're concentrating on kind of the middle market right because that's where the that's the largest segment of the market right and so while a lot of that stuff translates to a new lender some of the real basic stuff is not being discussed because it's kind of like, well, we know who our audience is and they, we figure they've gotten there. But when I get on console calls with a brand, I, I do, I do a one, at least like three times a week, literally it, it's, he's an investor who's thinking about doing this or has been doing it and is knows he's doing it wrong or is a flipper wants to start making loans. Like it happens to me. I talk to these people three times a week and the amount of like, 
they had no idea. Like they had no idea. And so the fact that this exists now for, for those kind of people, right? Anyone who's even remotely interested in this space as either an investor or someone who wants to start operating is, is so necessary because there's only so much, you know, we can do and so much, and so much AAPL can do because there's only so much time in the year. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. This episode is sponsored by PrivateLenderLink.com, where investors and brokers find direct private lending companies throughout the United States. Are you struggling to find the right lender for your deals? Private Lender Link offers a unique service to provide private lender recommendations. Over the past 10 years, they have established relationships with many reputable direct lenders and know each company's guidelines. Their platform makes the process to get recommendations very easy. Simply provide details about your loan request by filling out a short questionnaire. A lender link professional will review the information and invite a few select lenders to view your loan request. The lenders will reach out to you directly to further discuss the deal and provide a quote. Save yourself a lot of time and effort by leveraging Private Lender Link's knowledge, relationships, and 10 plus years in the industry. Their network includes lenders for commercial real estate, residential investment properties, and small businesses. To get started, visit privatelenderlink.com and click the big green button at the top. Another thing I want to kind of highlight, you guys are court, you guys are collaborating with APL this year, aren't we? Yeah, so, we are. Yeah, let us know about that because I, I I want to make sure you guys say it because it's a very important fact uh, feature that we, we haven't done in a long time. So, well, both Alex and I are members of the education committee with Apple. We really felt it was important to participate in that actively and still champion and create a voice for those small truly independent private lenders. Mm-hmm. Um, because to your point, I mean, I feel like we have steered towards. A, you know, a more graduated level of private lending in the industry where it's really predominantly more focused on commercial and larger loans and active mm-hmm. business. And so we've worked with um, Apple to create a series of uh, roundtable discussions on day two. Um, it'll be, be happening during the poker charity event, but we wanted to be able to establish a smaller community, a subset of Apple um, attendees and members to be able to come together and really truly discuss things that are important to them at the stage that they're at. Right. So if you're new and aspiring, you can go and talk with somebody and maybe you know somebody from Jirasi is there to help discuss just getting foundational Right. Um, awareness, legalities, uh, compliance, all that stuff. But to Alex's point, there's quite a few that are learning to scale because there are private lenders that stood up in their local RIA meeting and they became the most popular person in the room because they had private money. And especially in you know with the lender fragility that's in the marketplace right now, they're important. They're critical to a lot that's of real estate investors. That's, that's a term, right? Lender fragility. That's a good term. <laughs> that's a it's better than volatility, I'll tell you that much. That's, it's true. Yeah. Volatility. I mean, it happened in with when COVID hit. I, yeah. My my phones were ringing off the hook. Most of my lenders had stopped lending. Uh, my my lender counterparts locally. I mean, because you know, in the private money space, or in the active private money space, you've got local hard money lenders, and some of them were impacted because their levered funds were. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, could, they couldn't lend out of it anymore. And then you had regional carrier, regional lenders and national, which were completely contingent on the secondary market. And so mm-hmm. it was, it created a, a real good news story for private lenders like myself, mm-hmm. because we could come in and close at the, you know, at the closing table in the ninth hour when their lenders mm-hmm. backed out. And that's happening now too. Right. Back to the rescue. Yeah, definitely. I, I bet. We've been putting out a lot of content on the idea of like, you know, balance sheet, capital control, Mm -hmm. captive capital being kind of the blueprint in the space for longevity. But what's hard to understand by a lot of people is like, prove it, right? A lot of these people are, don't believe it, right? And so I kind of like want you guys to give me some experience sharing about how you guys have been able to succeed when the market has been displaced like this, when the institutions are having trouble. Because I honestly, from my perspective, it's like, yeah, rates are up, but the borrowers have been my, my theory on this has always been the borrowers have been expecting it. They know it's coming and they they're concentrated on getting their deals done. They rather get their deal done than not. So, I mean, you could give me your experience share on this, on this one guys. Cause I think a lot of people don't, don't believe me when I say it, cause I'm not a lender myself. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of borrowers expected it. Those that are experienced and those right. that had been investing prior to 08, mm-hmm. you know, the ones that, 
squabble over a 5% interest rate. Well, they clearly haven't been taking out loans in the 80s, 90s, or early 2000s because right. that was kind of the running, you know, the running interest rate. And so for us always too, as private lenders, what we're hearing, we always commanded higher rates, mm -hmm. right? We did things that maybe other lenders wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, and so people who wanted and needed to work with truly private capital because they knew that we could get across the finish line, mm -hmm. they were willing to pay that higher interest rate. And maybe they That's didn't it. even have to pay points with a lot of the smaller, you know, private lenders. They're not maybe charging that much in points or points at all. And they just want the passive interest rate. Right. Right. And the flexibility. The right there. You just said it, right? It's that the ability to execute matters more than anything else to a lot of these borrowers. Right. My, you know, my talk track always when I get people at rate shopping me is, you know, you can go to that national hard money or private money lender. Now, whether or not they can perform for you is qu questionable. Right. We know that happened in March of 2020. We know that it's starting to happen now in the last few months. Oh, and, uh, you know, I've got local lenders here that have paused on lending until at least the end of September mm -hmm. um, and have done so for a couple of months. And that's local. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not even including regional and national um, hard money. And so, you know, for us, we've remained true day in, day out. Pre-COVID, same rates. Post-COVID, right. same rates. We'll always close. Our underwriting never changes. You know, you're talking directly to a key decision maker. I right. don't have to go and take that loan to uh, a loan committee approval in right. a different part of the country. And so there is a place for us always in any, any market cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's why we've seen such an influx of interest in private lending lessons, you know, and Alec, people are reaching out to Alex all the time mm -hmm. to learn how to do it safely because they are the most popular person in the room right now. Right. What's, what I would say is really nice about, um, doing private lending as an active investor, most private lenders tend to be very, very hyper-local. So they are parts of the community. They probably know vendors the borrowers are going to need. Like, hey, I need a, a investor-friendly title company. I need a good yes. property management company. And so we can bring value to that lending relationship in ways that aren't necessarily financial, but could end up bettering the borrower in the long run. Adding and, value. Adding yes, value. And like a, and national lenders can't do that, you know. So when you're when you're talking to someone who's private capital that's lending in their backyard, there's a lot more value to be brought to the situation other than hey, what's your interest rate and what's your origination points? Like there's so many other things that you could do with a private lender that aren't necessarily a financial transaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess from a, the, to drive the point home. How how big do you guys think that this kind of, I guess, intro level to the market, that this actual truly private level to the marketplace is? Because it's hard to quantify, right? From my perspective, I think I, we've estimated the industry at large. If you include all DSCR and you include all you know, bridge lending, that's business purpose, right? Across the country, including construction, we estimate it to be at about $2 trillion, right? It, that's all the institutional money, all the term rental, all the build to rent, all that combined, right? When we evaluated the industry back in 2013, or 2014, I'm sorry, 2014, when this didn't exist, we evaluated it at about, we have, we have estimated it to be at about five billion dollars. But I'm tr I'm I'm trying to get get my get, I want our audience to understand what where what are they under like what what does this part of the industry constitute, right? It doesn't have to be dollars and cents, but like because I don't I I don't. I don't. I know. I know it's big. I know it's a lot of people that are doing these deals because we have a lot of these clients that are just solo operators. But a lot of the market is convinced. They're they're just convinced that this industry is now like non QM and conventional. We are now this commoditized, institutionalized space, and we all must now become the Borg, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I don't. I don't buy it. But I'm not an operator in the space, right? I, I'm a vendor to the space. I want to hear your guys' take on that. I don't. We definitely I... don't buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, now we're going. We've gone through two market cycles: at the beginning of COVID, and then the last, you know, two quarters. 
we're absolutely proving that wrong. You know, yeah. I kind of laugh at Apple last year, so much talk about DSCR, but right now DSCR loans are kind of dead. Mm-hmm. And they're quite expensive. That's why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a fr- five year prepay step down or having to buy down your rate, I mean, it's awful. And so this institutionally backed capital will always have its place. Just mm-hmm. as much as private lenders, truly individual private lenders will have their place too. I mean, it, I, I don't really find these to be mutually exclusive or we're growing into a certain uh, commoditized industry. Mm-hmm. The fact is there's active investors joining the market every single day because they right. watch HG, HGTV and they get all excited about it. Then they get older and start a family and then they want to retire and they sell off their real estate portfolio and they want to get into private lending. This isn't just ever, you know, a, a, an, a stopping point. This is a transition that will carry forward from generation right. to generation. It just doesn't represent a large amount of the capital in our industry. Well, I would beg to differ because the issue with the large capital, amount of capital, people forget how big some of these funds are that are actually just backed purely by high net worth investors, and their and their business model is one hundred percent true. How you guys call it, private money lending, because they don't do any. They they are very flexible. They're they don't do appraisal. They don't run credit. They they have their own credit box and they stick to it, right? And there's a lot of there's a still a good amount of those kind of lenders out there. What's really weird is that that the industry doesn't know about them that much anymore because they're not these big national shops. They don't have these giant marketing budgets, right? So, but some of these clients of ours have been reaching numbers of the volume of like, you know, in the billions. And that makes me scratch my head because I know that they're, they probably have a combination of institutional partners as well. But like, if you look at pure capital driven origination, it still got, has to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not in the billions. And so, you know, I think a lot of our industry I mean, people, thought leaders and people and influencers in this space think, oh, this is where it's headed. But you're right, Beth. I mean, this this cycle is proving the thesis, right? And that, and I like to ask you guys what your guys' take on this is. And I, I always talk about this a lot during like panels and webinars. Is the blueprint of a private lend, of a successful private lending business? What do you guys think that is? Oh, I'm going to go with 100. Um, percent a very relationship based model. Like Beth and I like to talk back and forth about the the jockey versus the horse. Mm. Um, But private lending is very much in my opinion, a relationship based model. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to know who my borrowers are personally. I'm going to know other people in the market that they've done business with, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's very similar in best market where, you know, a lot of people know her in her given market because she's part of that community. People have developed relationships and that, to, in my eyes, doesn't seem to exist very much in the hard money space. It's very transactional. It's like, hey, it's what are your rates? What are your fees? It's lost a whole lot of that. And I think more active investors are looking more for that personal touch because they love the idea of being able to text a private lender an address and a closing date and how much they need and potentially a private lender getting back to them in a couple hours and say, right. sure, let's go. Like there, we actually know people in our network that that's how they operate. That's how borrowers submit information to them because they built such a strong relationship with their borrowers mm-hmm. that, you know, you're not going to be able to do that with a national shop. Right. So implicitly then, right. Then it means either, you know, a handful of states at most, right. And that's your market. And you better have boots on the ground. You better have a team that that can do that for your borrowing clients, or just concentrate on your local market. And I think that that's like uh, we we saw a huge expansion to multi-state lending starting in sixteen, and that kind of triggered the institutionalization of the space. Oh, well, there's actually some scale to the space. That's what I think. That's what Wall Street realized. But a lot of the success stories that we've been hearing lately have been with folks that are like that. Right, they're they're lending in one, two, maybe three markets, right? Maybe two states at most, but they're doing very well. They're weathering every single storm that's being thrown at them, you know. And so, well, we're easier to work with. We have less requirements during the times of rate compression. Of course, it was a little bit more difficult for us to justify ourselves, right? Sure, sure, sure. But those days are gone. And so now, when you have the disparity between institutionally backed private money and truly private individual capital like us and and some funds, then that's kind of a no-brainer choice, right? Because you Mm -hmm. only have to have one bad experience where you're left. I I mean, I can't tell you how many people called us where their deals and their non-refundable earnest money was at risk because Mm -hmm. their lender just backed out. 
Yeah. Left and the altar. So, so many times. So many times. Um, or they were promised, you know, uh, 95% loan to cost, 90% loan to cost. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in the ninth hour, the underwriter comes back and says, I'm sorry, you're going to need to put 15 to 20% down. That's a huge change. You know, and so maybe things don't change whole, a whole lot in the commercial asset class space. But when you're talking about resi private lending, it absolutely has kind of flattened the competition here. We're just looking that much better because we've remained the same. We've been able to perform. Mm-hmm. Our rates and terms haven't really adjusted very much because we were never trying to lower them. My, my investors don't want lower interest rates, right? right. Um, they hated the rate. How is your volume? Actually, let's talk about how much, how, like, you don't have to give me numbers, but you can kind of give me general, like, I guess, on, on feel. How much has your volume increased since this recent lender fragility, as you call it, right? <laughs> as things have, as things, as, you know, as the, a lot of these national shops have been, have been struggling to perform, how much has your business grown actually? Uh, well, I guess since COVID it's tripled. Tripled. In and it's volume. still just right there in the, in the Washington area. Are you guys starting to expand? No, we're not looking to expand. We do do some uh, cross collateralizations where we help them take down properties in other states, but mm-hmm. it's really dependent on my uh, capital partners' right. comfort Fair level um, Fair and legal legalities. Of course, too, yeah, but, yeah, licensing yeah. and legalities, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I didn't I, have to do a whole lot of advertising and marketing wise when COVID hit to really shore yeah. up who we were and you know, what our core value was, you know, we're never going to be the Walmart out there. I will not compete with single digit rates. And I hope you can make good on that LOI from your lender. I, you know, I hope they follow through because right. I mean, I never want to pay more than I have to either, but if, and when they can't perform for you in the way that they need to, then we'll always be there. Right. Right. And I think that's a segment of the market that is oftentimes undervalued. And I think that a lot of people are opening their eyes to it. We're starting to see some interesting conversations and asks from some of these institutional shops, like, and they're, they're starting to kind of realize maybe, maybe a smaller operation or maybe a fund or maybe something that they can kind of keep, keep themselves in a much more long lasting uh, position, right? It's definitely that's, more sustainable, right? I mean, that's, that's what why I we always call about. ourselves a little lender that could. Like, I don't want to get too big because then I still can't perform at the same level, right? You know, right. in the same business model that has helped us get to where we are today, right? So. Exactly. And and a lot of people, like a lot of people in this market who are so institutionally dependent, kind of forget that you know that that market. You know, it's not what you think it is. You know, it's really an, an amalgamation of maybe three or four institutions that buy this stuff on volume. And at the end of the day, none of this is government backed. And so you really don't have, because a lot of these folks come from like the conventional markets, right? Oh yeah, it'd be fine. Look at Fannie Freddie. There's no Fannie Freddie in this space, guys. So I, I always kind of scratched my, I've always scratched my head and I, I, I never understood it, but I'm biased because I, I do I draw funds for a living, right? So I'm biased, <laughs> but but still, it, it, it's it's so refreshing to see it, and I'm really happy that you guys spent the time and energy to really kind of encourage and and excite the new lender jumping into the space. I really want our audience to pay attention to the Facebook group, and and then if you're a new lender, come to the roundtables because. This this kind of education is not as re, re, uh, re, uh, like a prevalently available anymore. It's hard to find good education on this kind of stuff. What better to get it from the ladies that wrote the book, right? So um, we're gonna go into the lightning round now. You know, I want to make sure we have time for the lightning round. Get to know you guys a little better personally. Uh, first question that we we have in our lightning round is: What was your very first job? Very first. Yeah. We had some really good ones lately, so I got to ask, what was your very first job? I was a baker at a cookie company at the mall. <laughs> and Mrs. Fields? <laughs> I know. It's, it's, <laughs> no, it's like the great, I think it was called the Great American Cookie Company. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, cool. Nice. I didn't know that, Alex. I mine was at a chocolate shop, so oh. it's kind of funny how many similar. <laughs> a lot of this stuff was meant to be in fun, guys. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So the next question is when you're not uh, dominating the lending lending world, right? The private lending world, what do you guys do in your spare time? 
I uh, recently bought a horse. I'm a horse person uh, well, by nature. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm at the barn pretty much every day I can possibly be at the barn. <laughs> the city boy here in California, that's just like, well, what? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, what kind of horse is it? Are there kinds of horses? There are kinds of horses. There are, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. uh, draft cross. So she's a big, chunky, little bit of a flake right now, but we're working on it. So is it meant for like just just for training or is it like for riding or for shows or like uh she the... will she will ride and drive. Oh nice. Very cool. I think you're this the is first one of her person. whys for getting in a private landing, by the way, too. So I just to think fund it's her awesome that she might yeah. get a horse. Yes, one hundred percent. That's exactly why oh, I yeah, did it. I, I hope my daughters don't see this. Dad, you can really buy us a pony, can't you? <laughs> I was once one telling you. It's an expensive right, habit. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Beth, how about you? I, I'm a, I am a mother of three. So we have a blended family of five and we like to travel a lot. I bought a second home in the suburbs of Vegas last year so that nice. we could spend some downtime there. Um, my husband and I, I like playing poker and, and running, although we don't do quite as much of those lately. We've been kind of busy. So, Oh, that poker tournament, man. Ah, if we have to. <laughs> Well, well, I can't do it because I'm going to be hosting, hosting round hosting tables instead, table. which is way yeah, more yeah, yeah, important. Yeah. So I'm sure the I'm sure I'll the, get some poker the rest in. Of the, <laughs> rest of the players are glad you're not going to be coming in and winning everything. So um, this is more of a business question for you guys. So what is one business tool that you cannot live without? Oh, for me, I'd say social media. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Expand. Um, just being able to kind of put yourself out there as to what you're doing, why you're doing it, who you're doing it with, where you're doing it. I think it's just, there's a lot of people, you know, think about people bored scrolling on their lunch break. You know, they, they want to be somewhere else other than their job while well, they're mm-hmm. going to go on to some sort of social media and consume something, some sort of information on there. And, and that's honestly where I got my start meeting other people in this space. Right. Right. It's really good, Alex. You're right. Because I mean, I think what she and I do so well together is adding value and leading with that first. Mm -hmm. And so it gains people's buy-in and Facebook has actually been, it's probably contributed about 70 to 80% of my business from the borrower side. It's also brought investors to me, not because I'm actively promoting or going and putting out ads. I don't pay a dollar. Mm -hmm. I just write blog posts and I go and comment for people and provide values. I mean, Alex has done so much education, one-on-one, taking phone calls, text exchanges, um, posting and commenting, especially through private lending lessons and giving so much value to other people in return. And that creates stickiness. Oh, yeah. I remember I, I could not, I mean, there have been so many great exchanges on there. And like, I, I watch it every night now because Nima and I are on there every night because like, there's some really good questions on there. Like, whoa, these are good. These are actually They're awesome. Good. They're thought provoking, right? They're really thoughtful questions. It's not just like, hey, I need a good, I need a good title company. Like, it's like really interesting questions that, like, if you weren't being creative, you wouldn't be thinking of it, about it this way. And so, and also just like some really good questions for the audience because they are oftentimes overlooked. Like last night, there was that um, that note, that note investment. A question like how, when does a note become a security base like oh thank you thank you you didn't just assume that it wasn't you know like so <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> it, was, it was great it was great and i love that about these kind of communities they're they're not scared to ask the questions and that's what i think that's what the problem right now is in our space is a lot of people are kind of scared because they they don't want to look stupid but like what it's okay just ask the question it, and no one's going to judge you. Just ask. And, and you, you may, and you can insert your, here's what I think about the situation. Am I wrong? Or however you want to do it. But, and I see people do that and it's great. And there's no flame. I don't see any flaming. I don't see any, you know, what we call it shit talking on there. It's been great. And I was expecting a lot of flaming on there because to be honest with you, because you know, you know, it can be on social media. Well, every rolling. private lender wants to think that the way that they're doing it is right. 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 But I love that creative banter that, uh, I call it, uh, uh, I don't know, disc discourse, creative discourse, yeah. because that's what, that's how, what shapes your perspective, right? A lot of good energy. As new lenders, we have no perspective. Right. So we can only lean on what other people have done, the mistakes they've made or the, 
the contemplations that they've taken into consideration. So right. and that's I, why I, this I've has had been some exchanges a- on there that were like really, really advanced level stuff. Like yeah. this is stuff that like, you know, on the highest level funds that we work on, we were doing, you know, offshore blockers and, and withholding and very complex tax issues. And I was like, wow, these really, like, they're really asking very good questions on here. And, and, I, and I love the, I love the fact that people aren't flaming each other, not trolling each other. It's been very, it's very productive and it's very cohesive while being still being quite active, which is, which is really rare to see because you see a lot of, I guess you can sell it. It's called it trolls on all, a lot of different forms. So, well, I think yeah, you I see mean, how hungry people are, the appetite they have for private lending education, right? Because it right. just never existed before Alex created the book. Right. Exactly. Which, by the way, yeah, I'll say true. that my my business tool that I can't live without is mm. partnership. Ah. Being able to partner with somebody like Alex, because, and I think that this is probably true for a lot of um, private lenders out there that are getting started you can't be all things to all people. Mm-hmm. And so you really need to have that balancing act in partnership where someone's probably a visionary and the other person's probably an integrator, right? Mm-hmm. Alex had this vision by way of a dinosaur, which is <laughs> <laughs> weird in and of itself, but Whatever man, she getting. came through, right? Like she right. went out and said, I'm going to get this published. I'm going to get us contracts. And she didn't just get us one. She got us two offers and with the biggest real estate education platform in the world. And so I think that a lot of lenders out there are people, fund managers who are wanting to create a business really need to rethink whether or not they have that right partnership with somebody that can run deep on operations and be that integrator, but somebody that can see the long range vision and help come up with new ideas and innovate in the private lending space. It's so important. And and there's so many different types of partnerships, you know, and you need to have those key relationships in the space. And I see a lot of people that like, I mean, I see this all the time. Nima Nima and I joke about it. Like that guy, just smartest guy in the room, right? He has to be the smartest guy in the room. He just, and it just puts everyone off. Like you're, you're not winning yourself any favors doing doing running things like that because if you're if you collaborate with the, your the guy sitting next to you you never know what you might what opportunity may come your way but yet you had to let your ego do the talking and you never know what kind of partnership you could have created right and i think it's a i think it's a a, a boy thing these boys are just they're bad they, they don't always <laughs> listen they they think they're the best <laughs> I'm and so happy you said that and not. It is. Yeah. Really <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And I say that all the time so I, because I, we I, have I, no I, ego. It's an ego thing, right? And like, yeah. I mean, shout out to Ruby was for setting up women in private lending because, like, I, I think it's one of the best things ever because, like, this industry could use a little bit of like putting ego aside. Unfortunately, you know, being in mortgage, it comes with a lot of real estate bros and and finance bros, and it's not good for the space because partnerships and really thinking about like, Hey, how can we work together? How can I help you? How can you help me is way better than look at me. I'm so cool. Right. And I know everything, you know, so. But Kevin, uh, do you know the conversation? I, women in private lending is such a great group. And I went to that first luncheon last year um, at Apple and we didn't start conversations about what asset class you lend in. We talked about impending wedding nuptials with Dana right. and raising small children with Christina and Kendra. And that's how women lead in right. because people don't care about what you know until they know that you care. But I think in a male dominated industry, it ends up becoming a peacock uh, syndrome okay. issue where everyone just wants to talk about who's bigger and better and their assets under management. But then for smaller lenders like myself, who don't have any desire to really scale um, significantly right. and for women who are trying to just struggle to run a business or or manage careers while we ha- are raising children mm-hmm. that's we bring some something completely different to this right. space a totally different tone to the topic and i think the, the dynamic that's been produced from it has been really nice because mm-hmm. a lot of times what what is it's been very productive for the industry because starting this conversation and we're starting to talk about it and it's and people are realizing like there's a lot of value and something like this beyond just networking it's 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 it allows for a deeper kind of i guess investment in the industry because like you said i mean a lot of times you're going to have these i like to call them real estate bros in their blue suits and brown shoes even though i wear blue suit and brown shoes <laughs> <laughs> you know peacocking around and it's, it's it, i i 
we see that every day. Does it help? It's not moving the industry forward because we want to invite everyone to the industry. We want every active investor who wants to start becoming a private lender of all shapes and sizes to the space. Well, we have to be able to invite them. We can't put them off, right? Um, it's usually one of the first three questions I get asked is how much I fund annually. I can't tell you how much. Yeah, what's your volume? What's your head? volume? What's your volume? Yes, what do you like? What do you like? I can't stand yeah, yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it's 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 cut to the chase type, you know, sales tactics, and it, it's out there. And I, I think that a lot has been lost in the space about relationship building. When the industry was a lot smaller, it wasn't like that. Uh, and I think that you know the fact that fact is that we're growing and the industry is growing. And there's positives and negatives that come with that. And I like the fact that we're concentrating on the relationships and the partnerships. I think that's going to take us further as a whole. And I really appreciate you guys like getting involved the way you have because you didn't have to. Like you really didn't have to. You could have concentrated on what you're doing and you know let everyone else kind of figure it out. But you know, thankfully this this investment has reaped dividends for both your business and you guys. So I'm I'm really, really glad you guys did it. Um one thing I guess the last question for you guys is what's what's next? What's next for you guys? What's next for you guys in the next coming incoming year? Is it another book? Is it a book tour? You gonna see a TV show? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had someone joke around about a TV show and they're like, next, coming up next, extreme signers. And I'm like, nobody's going to make a TV show about private lending. <laughs> You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. I, I have reviewed contracts extreme for signers. <laughs> doing spots on HGTV. You'd be surprised. I'm telling you. Oh my God. So yeah, I would love to have extreme signers. <laughs> That'd be fun because my husband would be such TV gold. Oh It'd be God. amazing. So would. It would be fun. He'd make it amazing. Amazing. <laughs> well, if Alex has her way, we'll end up on TV someday. <laughs> there are talks about another book. We're mm -hmm. um, in discussions about some training content out there. Cool. Um, you know, we're going to be doing some speaking engagements at Bigger Pockets annual conference here in October. The one in San so, Diego? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of folks don't know about that. So I, we're, we're going to be popping in for that. Oh, you are. Oh, Beer, this is good Beer because we're delivering a 90 minute presentation and you were kind of on our minds to <laughs> well, there you go. Maybe bring, it, bring into this. Yeah, I want to, to go down for that one because like it, I couldn't go last year because it's in New Orleans and it's just too, too hard to get there. But being in San Diego, I have no, no excuse. And it's a great place for for because they're they're really understanding now that, that private lending is something that they their their audience wants to know more about. So it's it's worth it's worth the investment in time and I, I okay so but the next thing on next thing on the radar is going to be the bigger pocket speaking engagement that's great hopefully a tv show hopefully another <laughs> book um for what i i want everyone to know about is that the round tables are really a big thing where i'm super excited for them because this is what i've always dreamed of for apl to give really good opportunity for new lenders beyond just what uh, the us attorneys can provide. So it's, it's, it's awesome that we're doing that. Um, well, we're going to have it you, catered to four different groups too, new and right. aspiring. Those that are established just want to stabilize and streamline. Right. Um, and those that want to scale and those that are managing funds. I mean, they all bring very different, unique challenges um, and current issues and trends to overcome. And so right. we'll have four separate groups associated with that. Even better. Right. Yeah. So for the, uh, for our listeners out there, if you aren't already signed up for the APL conference coming up in October, you better sign up, and uh, we'll all be there. Uh, and you got to make sure you go because it's gonna—it's the biggest industry event for the year. But this year is gonna be extra special with all these roundtables. So please join us there. And I think we can sign off with that note. Once again, I want to thank everyone for listening. Alex, Beth, thank you for joining us on the show, and uh, we'll see you guys in person at APL, and it'll be a fun a fun time. So for those of you listening, this is Kevin Kim for Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did enjoy, please leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform and be sure to follow our show to be notified of new episodes. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to smash that like button and hit subscribe for more content from all of us here at Jirasi. Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim is available on all podcast platforms. Referrals really help us spread the word. So please send this over to someone you think might enjoy it. See you next time. This is Kevin Kim signing off.